Hi, everybody, and welcome again to uh, today's uh, lecture. And we were talking about the Mars landing, which uh, some of us attended live at least, at least through uh, the SAM Center. Uh, others probably, hopefully, you guys will have a chance to look at it later on in the news. And it's a big deal, as probably some of you already have uh, felt it. And it's at least during this time of COVID things, this thing, I'm in a bright spot in the whole thing in here. That's good. Uh, we still have another major event toward the end of this year, 2021, which is the launch of the uh, James Webb uh, uh, Telescope, which is the next generation of telescopes that's going to bring us far, far more basically science than what the Hubble did. And uh, because it's bigger and it's more powerful and uh, actually it spans more uh, uh, span of uh, EM waves, electromagnetic waves, something that we will have in this class. And uh, it's going to teach us a lot about uh, basically planets outside of the solar system and also stars and the evolution of the universe and maybe galaxies and things like that. So it's fascinating things. So that's going to happen sometime in the fall of 2021. And hopefully you guys will be as excited as I am around that time also to make sure that that's also, that's not going to be as drastic as this one because once it leaves the earth, basically it's deployed in the sky and that's it. But this one is actually, there was a danger, an element of danger in it because first of all, the landing site that they chose for this one, in the Jezero crater, was uh, not the best place, not the easiest place to land in. And this was basically, uh, in the past was suggested as a landing site, but uh, it was declined because of the fact that it was dangerous. But this time around, we managed to basically come up with a few technologies. One of them is like a radar technology that basically we scan the ground and we see the terrain. And based on the information that uh, uh, the lander has, makes its own decisions. It has to be automated because uh, we cannot, it's, it cannot send signals and tell it to go this way. You cannot basically steer it because it's on its own. It's very far away from us that we cannot really control it. Uh, you're trying to speak. I cannot hear if you're trying to say something. Raquel? Anyway, so today's lesson is about Newton's laws which is also a big deal for you guys, okay? Uh, we're going to start with the first law of Newton. This is something of extreme importance. So you guys need to really, uh, I mean, let's put it this way. The three laws of Newton, the promise of them is that uh, they will help us solve any kind of problem of physics. Imagine the following. I mean, we were just talking about the lander and how we sent it. It was sent based on calculations done on Earth, leaving Earth Ju uh, July 30th, and it was on its own. So it was a projectile. So basically you throw a rock in the sky and you would want it to land on Mars. And Mars is, if you look at the horizon, it's very far away. It's almost uh, uh, the distance from the Earth to the sun. It's really a huge distance. And uh, you wanted to go to Mars, not only to Mars, but you wanted to be on the equator of Mars. Not only in the equator, but you wanted specific point in there. How do we know all of this, how to do these calculations? It starts with this three laws of Newton, okay? This is one of them. This is the first law of Newton. The promise is that if you understand the three laws of Newton, and you have enough computing power, mainly basically uh, uh, computers and things like that, you should be able to do whatever you want to do. You should be able to solve any problem in physics. That is the promise that this entails. However, you will see down the road that there are some, uh, uh, the, some issues with this loss. But at this point, for practically everything we do on a daily basis, we drive our cars, we go somewhere and do things like that. Everything that we do on a daily basis can be uh, basically resolved to one of or the combination of two or more or all of these three laws. That's it. Okay. There are some extreme conditions which are not on a daily experience, such as, for example, going extremely fast, almost with the speed of light, 
then in this case, hey, it fails. We don't go with the speed of light. So that's when relativity takes over. Or when we are very, very close from the sun, like Mercury is, then our, the behavior of Mercury cannot be explained with this loss. It has to go back into relativity. When you are very close from, for example, a black hole, then in this case, this loss fails. But if you are far away from the sun, like the Earth is, and even Venus is, which is closer to the sun, you're fine. The physics that we're doing right now should apply 100%. Now, the other extreme also condition where these things don't apply is also when we are dealing with the extreme tiny particles, like, for example, electrons and protons inside the atom, which we'll be doing in this class too. So in that level, this physics also failed. Because one of the things that we will not be able to do, and like, for example, on our daily basis, which is something called the path. Uh, a car leaves, for example, on the freeway, goes around and comes back. It has gone through a path. This we can describe with this loss. However, that concept doesn't exist anymore on the level of electrons and protons. That's where quantum mechanics takes over. Okay. So there are extreme conditions when these three laws do not apply, but for our daily experiences on a regular basis, we're in great shape, okay? We should be able to do everything that we need to do on a daily basis. You ask me, for example, how the cell phone works in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, electronics inside and basically condensed matter inside and semiconductors and things like that inside. Well, at that point, this laws will not work because again, it's quantum mechanics. So that's really the exciting thing about this chapter. So as, a, as excited as I was earlier in the day for some of you who were there uh, about the landing in Mars, this one also is very, very exciting. And for you today, it's a big deal because we're introducing the laws of Newton and there are three of them. So this is the first law, it's the law of inertia. So let me share with you the screen. Okay, so this is uh, Newton's first law of motion. Newton's first law of motion out of fairness is not really, uh, it's not Newton, excuse me, who uh, derived it, but it's actually Galileo, Galileo himself. But Newton, when he came out, Galileo didn't care very much honestly about the causes of motion. All he cared about is the motion itself. Galileo was interested in describing motion and he came up with outstanding concepts, like, for example, the concept of velocity and the concept of acceleration. Uh, I mean, they existed before. People knew about speed and things like that. But he was able to give them numbers and a way of how to calculate them. I tell you, for example, this object is moving with this going with it on its own. And this object is moving, but it's a little faster. And this one is actually faster than the second object. And the third one is not as fast as the third object, but it's actually faster than the second. And the fifth one is faster than the first, but less fast than the second. You know how complicated it gets by the time I reach the 27, 27th object? You lose track of what is 10 in terms of this thing. But if I put a number to it, if I tell you this object is going 27 miles per hour, this object is going 28 miles per hour, this object is going 37 miles per hour, this object is going 122 miles per hour, and this object is going 0 0.1 miles per hour, not only you have a ranking for these things, but you actually have a feel of what that means. The 0 0.1 miles per hour, a tenth of a mile per hour versus the 125 or 127 miles per hour, there is a big gap between them. So one of them, it's not just he's moving faster, but he's moving super fast. The other one is barely crawling. You see the, the, the numbers in here, they play a major role. That's why, uh, uh, as we said in the previous chapter, we are smarter about these things. Now We know more about them than what we knew before. That's what Galileo's contribution was. Not only that, he introduced also the concept of an acceleration. An acceleration is the rate at which the speed is changing. Here is the speed, which is the rate at which the position is changing. But now the acceleration is the rate of which the rate of the position is changing. So it's a rate of a rate, namely 
the units for it are meter per second per second or meter per second squared. So that's basically how this things came about. Then came about the concept of, uh, uh, of inertia. Because in Aristotle idea is that objects have the tendency to be where they are. They, they want to stay in their position and uh, here is an object. Let me switch cameras quickly with you guys. And I'm gonna demonstrate the inertia with it too. Okay, where is the camera? Here is the camera. Let me remove the background quickly first. Because when I do this camera, for some reason, in the background, this is a picture. Go to video, switch cameras. OK. So what you're looking at is this object, which has a, it's a big, heavy object. As a matter of fact, this one is about, I would say, about 200 grams or more, about quarter of a, about half a pound. OK, it's a big object. So right now, I put it in here and it's not going anywhere. So I can say that this object is stationary. Can I say that or not? Yeah. Yes. OK, it's not going anywhere. Now, if I change its position, I'm going to pull on the paper. This is a paper, by the way, an eight and a half paper, an eight and a half, eight and a half by 11 paper, a normal letter paper. So I'm going to pull on it. It's changing position, OK? The object now is clearly moving on the screen, as you can clearly see on this old cutting board that I use for everything. And uh, the reason why it's moving is because I applied the force on the, on the paper, which is basically connected. It's not attached or anything like that. There is no glue or anything. But because it's pushing hard on the paper, and the interaction between the paper and this block cause it in such a way that there is a friction between them. And the friction usually is proportional to the normal force, uh, which causes it basically, because this one is kind of heavy, so it's going to be dragged with it, OK? But what would happen if I pull fast on it, OK? In this case, the block stays in its place, whereas the paper is pulled. And you probably have seen this so many times, at least on YouTube and probably on TV or something like that, where uh, uh, they have uh, plates on a table, on a dining table with coffee and probably food and things like that. And the waiter or something just pulls the, the entire, uh, what is it, the, the thing underneath there. What do you call it? The, the... the tablecloth. Cloth, yeah, thank you very much. Have a nice day. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so that's the word that escaped me. So they pull on it, and now everything stays in its place. And that is a demonstration of the, 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 the principle of inertia that this object in here doesn't like really to move because of its mass. Okay, its mass, the mass doesn't want to change its state of motion. It was stationary, it wants to stay stationary. So if I pull on it, it really doesn't like to change, but it changes ultimately if I do apply force to it. For example, if I'm going to push it in here, it's going to move, but I have to push it and it's going to resist the motion, motion until at some point. There is another demo that is also famous. What I have in here, I have a cup, a teacup, okay? And this is, I don't have any cardboard, so I have this thing in here, which is from something I bought, which I have no idea what it was now, what it is now. Anyway, so I put the quarter in there. And again, if I pull on it or if I push it in here, it's going to drag because of, again, the same force that caused the first one to drag. It's going to drag in here. But if I apply a force all of a sudden, it really doesn't like to change its, uh, its, uh, its, uh, its, uh, its state of motion, which is rest right now. And uh, it should stay in its place. Oops, that's not enough force. I did not kick the... Uh, Okay. You see the quarter stayed in its place, and because now it lacked the support, it dropped in the uh, in the cup, whereas the paper flew in the other direction. So that is a demonstration again of the concept of inertia. Question number one of the day today: Remember that we have items of discussion. Is to do this on your own, whichever you choose, and demo it for us and explain in your own words. I just explained it. 
basically of what's going on based on the concept of inertia. So let me switch cameras quickly. What is the cameras? Let me put a background in here. So that it's not this ugly green thing in here behind me. Okay. So you guys understand item one of the discussion today? So you, you want us to write and explain what's happening? Yeah, you're gonna write, you're gonna first of all demo it. You try to grab whatever you have at home, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Quarter will do, cup will do, and uh, card stock if you have one or something like this one in here, okay? And demo it yourself, take a short video if you can, hopefully no more than a minute if you can. If you can do a video, that's fine. You can still do a, 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 a picture okay of your setup and if it didn't work that's fine just tell me to work because i probably didn't have the right paper for it and if it worked that's great and the fact that you have experimented with this law of inertia okay mm -hmm. thank you does everybody understand what's item number one of the discussion today yes yes Okay, very good. So that is basically what we mean by the law of inertia objects. I mean, you experience it yourself. You're sitting in the car, okay? Let's say, for example, you're riding in the car and you're kind of dozing, you're sleeping. And as far as you're concerned, the car is stopped. It's not moving because you're fine. Then all of a sudden, somebody hits the brake. What happened in this case is that you move forward. Your body was actually moving forward. Now it wants to keep that motion forward. If you're not wearing, wearing any seat belt, you're gonna actually bump your head into the uh, the, 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 the tablo board. What is the, the dashboard, okay, of the car, okay? Or if the car takes off immediately also, you'll find yourself pushed away. That's the law of inertia too. Or if you're going on a curve, you experience that too. Whichever way the car is turning, you're going to feel the opposite. If the car is going this way, you're going to feel your body continuing that way because of the law of inertia. Okay, So that is basically what is meant with it. So what Mr. Galileo actually did is he took an experiment, he took an incline, he took a bunch of marbles, and he basically dropped them from the incline and he noted when they stop. Okay, That's easy enough. He took another marble and now he smoothed the surface a little bit. He made it smoother. And he dropped now the marble from the same spot and he noted that it doesn't stop in the same place. It stops further away. So he made the surface even smoother with the same inclination, of course. You don't want to change the inclination and you want to drop. When you're doing an experiment in science, especially in physics, you have to have what is called the control parameters. You would want your independent variable, which is in this case, is how smooth the surface is. That changes the only one of them. In this case, you would want everything to stay the same, namely the height from which you drop the, the marble. And in this case, also the inclination stays the same. The only thing he was changing in that time is the, 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 how smooth the surface was. And each time he noted that the marble, the smoother the surface, the marble, the, the longer it's going to travel before it stops. So he postulated that the, 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 the nature of objects is, is not actually to stay in their places. It's to be in motion. Okay. Unless a force actually acts on them to stop them or something like that. So that's really how that is. I mean, if an object is at rest right now, it's probably at rest with respect to some reference frame, with respect to some observer. Let me ask you a question now. Are we really stationary right now? I'm sitting in my desk right now. Am I going anywhere? I mean, relative to you, yes, but like relative to the earth or the solar system, you're moving. We are moving. How fast do you think we're moving? Does anybody have any idea? Let's give you a number, okay? Is, are we moving faster than a car or the car is moving faster than us right now on average, okay? Are we moving more than 100 miles per hour or less than 100 miles per hour? It's more, right? A thousand maybe, a thousand miles per hour? 
what do you guys think? Is it too much? Let's put kilometers, okay? Because I don't know much about miles, okay? Is it a thousand kilometers per hour, which is faster than a plane? Or moving slower than that? Supersonic. Faster. faster? Faster. How much? 10,000 kilometers? That's a lot, 10,000 kilometers. That means in one hour where we have zoomed 10,000 kilometers. Do you think that's a good number or is it higher than that? I think higher. Okay, how about 100,000 kilometers per hour? Hmm. Does it does it stop there? <laughs> I feel like that's too fast. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe less. Slow down, okay? Because <laughs> please don't stop me. I'm going toward the end of the thing. Okay, let's find the number for us. Okay, I'm going to eh, let's be switch to the other camera because that's a good camera too. Okay, instead of writing on the PowerPoint, I can write in here too. Okay, so let's me do the other camera again, and let's remove the background for a minute. Okay, let's find this number. The Earth distance to the Earth to the, this is the sun. Okay, this is where the Earth is roughly. Okay, this distance is known to be one astronomical unit, which is about 150 million kilometers. If you Google it, you're gonna find it's 150 million kilometers or 93 million miles. It's the same thing, okay? So if you're curious trying to find it in miles, you can. If this path is a circular path, which is roughly it is, okay, then the circumference of this circle is two pi times the radius or pi times the diameter. If this is the diameter, the diameter is just twice the radius. So pi times the diameter, which is two times this number, 150 million kilometers, When the Earth goes once around the sun, how many, how long does that take? Do you guys know? Isn't it like around 360 days? Yeah, the, uh, how many years that is? How many yeah. years does this? How many? One year. One year, very good. <laughs> so yeah, that's gonna be, we, we go once around the sun, this time around next year, we would have completed a whole cycle. So it's gonna be one year, which is exactly what you said, 365 days a year. That's the number of days times 24 hours because every day has 24 hours. So if I do this algebra, and if I'm not mistaken, pi, which is just a 3.14 roughly, okay? That's geometry. That's what the Babylonians have discovered for us, that the circumference of a circle is just pi times the diameter or pi times twice the radius. This is the radius. This is about, if you're curious trying to do it in miles, you can just convert this one into miles. Two, which is part of the diameter thing, divided by the uh, one year. One year is 365 days, and one day is 24 hours. If I do this algebra, I will find the number to be about 107,000 kilometers per hour, or around 60,000 miles per hour faster than anything that we have built. So uh, it's been almost half an hour since we've been sitting together. Are we in the same place than we started today? No. We left where we started about 50,000 kilometers away. We're traveling together. We are on a journey together. So every time we meet, we're actually sitting in a boat and a ship, and that ship is tra traveling super fast, and that ship is the Earth, actually. So we st when we started this class, we started it very far away, about 50,000 kilometers away, and now we're here, okay? And we're not stopped, actually, we're moving. So actually, the concept in here that I want you guys to understand is that uh, uh, object like I was describing in here that it's stationary, it's really not stationary, it's in motion. With me and the table and the desk and computer and microphone, and the light and everything, the tree outside and everything, okay? 
everything is in motion and it's all you guys are also we're all drifting in the same speed okay so again uh, that when mr mr galileo passed away around the, the same time when mr newton was born so mr newton when he came in he was more interested in explaining the causes of motion okay what causes motion for that he came up with three laws the first one, law is verbatim of what mr uh, Galileo has done, and that is the fact that objects at rest, they will stay at rest because of that observer. For me, they are at rest, okay? For me, this, this block is at rest. For somebody else who is probably moving in an opposite direction at constant speed, this object is moving. As case in point, the Earth is actually moving with respect to the sun. So with respect to the sun, this object is moving, okay? And the sun itself is actually not stationary, it's going super fast around the axis of the galaxy. So everything is moving. So anyway, if the object is at rest, it's going to stay at rest. If an object is going to be, if the object is uh, moving, it's going to continue moving as long as it's not subject to no, no net forces. So that is the first law of Newton. Okay, that is item two of the discussion today. I want you to put it in your own words. The first law of Newton to be put in your own words, okay? Basically, what it says is, and you can write it down if you like, uh, when an object, one object, okay? We don't care about the other objects. If you're focused on this block, it's this block that you're studying only, okay? If you're focused on the earth, the earth is the thing that you're studying. If you're fo focusing, for example, on, doesn't matter, on this magnet, it's this magnet that you're studying, not anything else, okay? If an object is in there no net forces, basically there are no forces acting on it. And if that object was at rest, it's going to be stay at rest. If it was moving, it's going to continue moving in the same direction with the same speed. So that is basically what the first law of Newton is. So that is item two today, okay? So we have a couple of items already. So hopefully you guys picked up on those. Okay. Force turn out to be a vector. That's one of the things that will be a, a study understanding. And also the equilibrium rule, basically when in the world is an object at rest. Okay. Let me take this surface now, it's actually smoother. And put this object. This object right now is at rest with respect to me and to the board in here. The reason why it's an rest is because it's an equilibrium the net forces acting on it is zero. It has weight. So if it was only for the weight, it should fall, but it's not falling because there is a support force coming from the board itself, preventing it from falling. And that force is actually perpendicular to the surface itself. And it's just enough to keep it from falling. And that is the support force that we will need to introduce in here, okay? The support force is what is known also as a normal force, okay? Equilibrium of moving things is actually more general than static equilibrium, and that is dynamic equilibrium. For example, when you're cruising in your car and you have the cruise control at 50 miles per hour, you could have this cup, for example, full to the brim with tea or water, whatever you want to, and it's not going to spill as long as you're moving with constant speed, and also no bumps, okay? That means there is no forces. If there are no external forces, basically the forces cancel and you're going at constant speed, it is the same thing as if you're not moving at all. And you can try this. I mean, as long as you are on the freeway and there is no bumps in the freeway or anything like that, you could have your cup of coffee and you'd be sipping it with absolutely no problem whatsoever, okay? So that's the the idea behind equilibrium of moving things. And I just went through the calculation of the fact that the earth is actually moving. So this is in, in, in a nutshell what the chapter is. So that's basically what we're doing today. Okay. So it's just going through the stuff that I went through. And if you have any questions, please let me know. And we're gonna go through some examples in here. So Aristotle's basically idea, Aristotle idea, albeit is wrong, was uh, lasted for a long, long, long time for basically almost 2000 years. 
I mean, he's got so many classifications and things like that. One of the issues that Aristotle run into is the issue of uh, why objects, when you apply forces to them, move faster than other objects, okay? Move further than other objects if you apply forces on, the, on them with the same thing. I'm gonna go back into my other camera in here to show you what's going on in here. And let me remove the background again. I have two objects in here. If I apply a force on this object, it moves. If I apply the same force on this object, it moves and actually came out completely out of the, uh, the thing in here. One of them stopped for before the other one. Can you guys tell me why? Do you think the first one stopped for first and the second one did not? Do you have any idea why that is? Do their weights have anything to do with it? Okay, I could come up with the same weight of this ball as this one. I will do the experiment and it's going to be the same thing. It's not a mass, really. Would it be the shape? Shape. I could come up and forget about the shape, okay? I'm going to do this then. Okay, which one do you think is going to you know, stop first, okay? It's very hard to even keep it from moving, let alone. <laughs> okay, which one do you think will stop first? Uh, this guy is moving by itself. <laughs> so is it the shape, really? Just yeah. both of them are... What? Okay, I got it to stop. Is it mass? So... Okay, the mass, we eliminated it with the first uh, this thing, okay? So if I put the same mass of this two, uh, we will know that this one will continue this, uh, in the same direction. Okay, so the mass is not the issue. The could shape actually the is not the issue because both of them the have the same. I'm sorry? Could it be the position, like where it's located on the board? We can we can actually take this one and put it in here and do the experiment and we should be able to get the same thing. To get this one, actually this one is not even stopping, let alone this one is actually easier stopping, okay? So it's not the position. So that's how you think in terms of sciences. You decide to eliminate all the processes. So Mr. Aristotle had an explanation for it, or at least his, yeah, his, himself and his followers later on. Do you think what his explanation was? Do you know what his explanation is, was? I'll tell you what it was. He said the reason why some objects stop before others is because they have memory, they remember to stop because they want to be at rest. More than the objects that have very lousy memory, basically, that remember later that they were supposed to stop. It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? You guys understand? Because if you do the experiment one way, you eliminate this, you eliminate that, you eliminate all of the other possibilities, then at the end, you come up to a conclusion that there is something inherent in these objects, that others do not have it. And the only thing he could come up with is memory. So somehow, this one has better memory than this one, which has better memory than this one. That sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? You guys agree? Yeah. <laughs> This idea lasted for about 2,000 2, years, not two centuries, 20 centuries, 2,000 years, okay? Before Mr. Galileo actually, uh, 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 come on, it's gone. It's all over the place, that ball, okay? Before basically it was disproved and Mr. Uh, uh, Galileo is the one who actually came up with an explanation Okay, this is still the same Aristotle ideas. Mr. Galileo actually proved that it has to do with the inertia, okay? And the friction is the one that was actually stopping one or the other. It's a force actually that was causing the stopping. It's not anything else. And the force is actually inversely proportional to the inertia of the objects. So that is really uh, something uh, that was a major revolution. This is 
something that came later on. One of the things that he actually did, he went to the Tower of Pisa and he dropped similar size objects with different masses, okay? And he showed that the objects would fall at the same rate on Earth, okay? And uh, this is really a major, major discovery that he did because one of the things that uh, people do not really appreciate very much that what he did, and there was another thing also when we come to light, we'll talk about it, what he did too. He tried to measure the speed of light too. So he did a lot of things. That's why we call him Big Man G because of the things that he contributed to science. He did a lot. One of the things that he was able to measure at this point in here with the incline actually is the value of little g. Probably you heard of it, which is the gravitational pull of the earth. Okay. So the letter G in here stands for gravity, and it turns out to be 9.8 meter per second squared. This is what is causing you to tire on a daily basis, the weight that you basically experience. Okay. So this is the value of uh, of little g that we use in all of the experiments. And it was discovered by big man G himself, by uh, Mr. Galileo, okay? So, uh, and this is done to, through his experiments with the incline. So, uh, like I said in here, one of the things that when he stated the law, right now it looks obvious to us because of the experience that we have. So if you drop, this is too steep of an incline, usually it's a lot less than this. So when I drop the marbles, they will travel. The smoother the surface, they will travel and further and they will travel based on that. And the idea in here is that imagine he told them with me that the surface is 100% smooth, meaning that it's as smooth as it can. There is no reason for it to stop, so it's going to continue forever. Today, we live in an age where we have reached the atmosphere and we want to actually, uh, we, we became an interplanetary uh, species meaning we can actually test this experiment in the, when there is no friction, when there is even no gravity. So we can actually test this experiment, but at the time when he was doing it, there was no such a thing. He was able to do this thing and we were able to, uh, and he was able to make an argument, solid argument for it. So it's kind of hard I mean, to, to really uh, imagine at that time if there was no friction because there is no such a thing. It's always friction is there. The other thing also that he, we credit him for is this value of G, which is 9.8. He didn't have a watch actually to use at that time. And during the time when he developed this idea, which was in the early 1600s, he didn't have an iPhone either. Were you guys surprised? People did not have iPhones at that time. He did not. So what do you think he used for a watch? The sun. Uh, sorry? Sand. Rodrigo. He used sand? No, he did not use a sand watch. He did not use the sun. He used something else. The suggestion, somebody is talking, I can't hear what, he, what they're saying. Okay. Let me tell you what he did, okay? He uses the pulse of his hand. Okay, I cannot even feel mine. But for some reason, he was so attentive to this thing and he was able to use time and he was able to find the value of G, okay? So that's the watch that he had to tell you about how much meticulous he was about collecting data and things like that. So we have to give him credit for that. He basically, because of his support of Copernicus view that the earth is not the center of the universe and rather the sun is, he was prosecuted by the church and basically excommunicated from it. And when do you think the church realized they made a mistake with him and they basically uh, acknowledged that? This happened in the early 60s. He died in 1640, 41, I think, or something. When do you think the, ch the church, at least the Pope, realized that, hey, we made a mistake with this guy? 100 years later? <laughs> 100 years later? Actually, more than that. 1,000? Sorry? 
thousand years? <laughs> no, no, it's only 400 years since he passed away. It's actually less than that. <laughs> oh, I'm silly. <laughs> When do you think the church finally recognized that they did injustice to him and indeed the earth is actually going around the sun rather than the other way around? So you you, uh, you suggested 100 years, I said it's more than that. 200? You, more than 200 years before the church recognized that they did him an injustice. 350? More than 350 years. In the 1990s, finally, when the Pope said that, okay, Mr. Galileo, apparently we made <laughs> we did an injustice against him, almost four centuries later, which really kind of uh, sad that you see that. I mean, he did like, great things for us in science. You say something, Raquel? No, I was just clearing my throat. <laughs> okay, so. The concept of a force is basically at least at this point in here, we'll discover other kinds of force that act at a distance, like the force of gravity is a push or a pull, like I was demoing earlier, okay? Inertia, which is really the, 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 uh, the resistance to the change in motion, like mass, that is basically what uh, another property of the object. This has inertia. Whether or not I apply force to it depends on outside stuff like me pushing on it or pulling on it or the earth pulling on it okay or the the support for example keeping it from falling so the force is an external agent okay whereas the the, the inertia which is the mass is an intrinsic property it's not an it's a property of this object okay it's a property of matter to resist change in motion it's a lot easier for me for example to stop a bicycle then a train. Which one has more inertia, a train or a bicycle? Train. Definitely. So do not do this experiment, okay? Do not try it on your own. When you try to stop a train with your hand, it's not going to work, okay? Because it has far more inertia. Which one is easy to push, a bicycle or a train? Try to push a train when it's stationary. Even bring your friend with you, you're not going to be able to, okay? Again, because of the inertia. Again, this is basically the concept that Mr. Galileo has been experimenting with. And in here, the speed is increasing. This is an accelerated motion. The speed is actually decreasing. This is a decelerated motion. And in here, the speed should not change. Unless, of course, there is a friction which causes it to slow down. The use of inclined planes for Galileo's experiment helped him discover what? What's the big fuss we've been talking about? I've been talking about, I've been making in here today. The dimension inertia. about momentum or energy, inertia, very good. That's the one, okay? <laughs> so that's what he demonstrated, okay? So this is the way it's stated in here, the Newton's law, uh, first law of the motion, which is really a rework of Mr., basically a restatement of Mr. Galileo, okay? You're supposed to put it in your own words. Okay, net force is really, force is a vector quantity, which is like the velocity. Velocity is a vector quantity, which has direction and magnitude. Those are the two key, key things in here for a velocity. Velocity in general has uh, direction. That's a vector engine, direction plus uh, magnitude. That's what a vector is. This is a case, for example, for velocity. Velocity. My screen keeps on telling me to save this thing, and I really don't want to do that. And force. OK. Probably should do this in the, what do we call it? Slideshow, maybe, to prevent that from.
Are you still with me here? Can you still see this thing? Because my screen went, both screens now have stuff on them. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, we can see, yes. yeah, we can see it. Okay, pretty good. Because both screens, they have all kinds of things. Okay. So basically, again, uh, a quantity that is not vector, for example, temperature. Temperature is not a vector, it's a scalar that you have to make to be uh, to be aware of. The speed itself is a scalar. So if I, you tell me you're doing 50 miles per hour, uh, you don't tell me the direction with which you're moving, I don't know. The same thing with the force in here. Force has a specific direction you apply it in and also magnitude. It has a magnet, that's why it's a vector, okay? And the representation for it is by arrow. Usually when you write a vector for the force F, you write it F, Okay, I can't. Can I take my that. iPad to your internet so I can get a book? I'm sorry? Oh, no. <gasps> okay. Okay, I think I have to exit this thing in here because it's not working. I cannot write this. Uh, can I try it on the screen now because of the fact that the screen moved to the other side and now I cannot do anything? Okay, anyway. So the vector is represented usually with a letter. With a, with a symbol of an arrow on top of it. So when you see that, that's what we mean by vector. Examples of vectors, of course, force, velocity, and acceleration. And down the road, we'll discover more vectors such as momentum, for example, which is a vector. Scalars, I already mentioned temperature. There is another scalar that we will use as kinetic energy, for example, or energy in general is a scalar, which is a number like 12, number, okay? When we say the temperature is so-and-so, that's a number, okay? So the net force is the sum of the forces. Force is a vector that adds up. In this direction, in this case, all the forces are in the same direction. So if I have a five Newton on one side and a five Newton on the same side, it's as if I'm pulling with a 10 Newton, as if it's not a real thing. This is not a real case. This is equivalent case. I may have a rope in here and I may have something else also pulling on this side. So I may have a horse in here pulling and I may have myself in here pulling each and every one of us with five Newton. That is the real situation. But this equates to that, the other situation as if somebody is pulling with 10 Newtons. Now, the real situation is like the tug of war is that I could be pulling with five Newton on one side and somebody else is pulling with five Newtons on the other side as if we're not pulling at all, as if none of us is there. So this is again, the net force in here. So why is this? This thing all of a sudden is, this is the equivalent. This is the net, okay? As if it's, this is what it is, okay? So that's basically what that situation is when everything else cancels. Okay, just, just an example for this. One force is 15 Newton and the other one is 20 Newton and they are not on the same thing. So in this case, it's just the difference of the two and it's going to go toward where the higher is. So the right is 15 Newton and the left is 20 Newton. So the net one is going to be five Newton to the left. Okay, not five Newton to the right. Okay, because forces are vectors. So vector has magnitude and direction, as I said, and is represented by an arrow like force, velocity, and acceleration. These are the concepts that we know for right now. The scalars are, for example, mass is a scalar, is a number, okay? Volume is a scalar, speed is a scalar, and I already mentioned a couple more. Uh, one of them is the energy, which we'll discover later on, and the other one is temperature, which we'll discover later on. The resultant is the sum of everything, okay? The sum of the vectors. If the two vectors are acting perpendicular to one another, let's say, for example, I have five Newton in here and I have five Newton in here with the condition that this angle is actually a 90 degree angle. If that's a 90 degree angle, I will use the Pythagorean theorem to add this to a vector and this is the resultant as if it's square root of five squared plus five squared. So this is five squared, five also because that's parallel to this one, 
So this is going to be the square root by the Pythagorean, the resultant in here is going to be 5 squared plus 5 squared. And 5 squared is 25. And 5 squared is 25. And if I have a calculator, I'll do the square root of uh, 50. The square root of 50 should be slightly more than 7, because 7 times 7 is 49. And 50 is more than 15, uh, 49. So it's going to be slight around 7 okay, newtons. So the sum of these two forces is not as we did before. If they're in the same direction, so you add them up in the same direction. If they're opposite one another, you subtract them. But if they are perpendicular to one another, you use the Pythagorean theorem now. It's like, for example, you have an airplane that is going in one direction and the wind is, let's say, for example, it's going north on, from the south, south-north, and the wind is blowing uh, west-east. So the plane is actually drifting in the middle toward northeast. That's exactly what's going on, because that's how vectors add up. Does this make sense to you guys? Yeah. Yes. It's basically, this is the challenge, OK, for you. The river is flowing this way, OK? And you would want to swim, swim here. So if you f try to swim directly to the other side, you're going to find yourself in here because the river is going to push you this way. So what you do in this situation, actually, if you want to end up there, is you swim slightly against the, uh, the, the current to find yourself where you're supposed to go. You guys see that? Because now your speed, which is slightly this way, and that of the current, when you add them up, they will add up to this speed. So this is the effective speed, same thing on how you're supposed to go. Does this make sense? Yeah. Yes. OK, very good. So you have to always have that in mind, this analogy is on how to get into there. OK? Obviously, this is a complicated situation where the Pythagorean theorem does not work in it, but this one is. And let's say, for example, the plane is going north 100 miles per hour, and the wind is blowing uh, uh, east 100 miles per hour, you're going to drift at 141, which is just the square root of 100 squared plus 100 squared, which is 10,000 squared. When you square root 10,000 squared, it's going to be around 141. You're going to drift, <coughs> excuse me, northeast, not 200 and not 100. It's just somewhere in between them. Okay. So that's basically how this idea is because they're vectors. So this is the, the illustration of what I was talking about in here. So if I do 30 squared, that's 900, plus 40 squared, that's 1,600. Add 1,600 plus 900, that's 2,500. If I take the square root of 2,500, and if I punch it on the calculator, it's going to give me 50. So if I'm, what is this one? Referring to the following, OK. So that's basically an example of what I was talking about. So this is the Pythagorean theorem because this is a right angle triangle. And Pythagorean theorem said that the hypotenuse is equal to uh, the sum of the square. The hypotenuse squared, that is, is equal to the square of uh, the adjacent squared plus the square of the opposite squared. And the sum of them are equal to square of this number. So if you really want to find this number, you have to square root the sum of the squares. OK. Did you guys have the Pythagorean theorem somewhere before in math or somewhere? Yeah. High school? Yeah, that's basically a refresher of that. OK. Same thing in here. This is a little bit more complicated, but it's similar in here. So if she's hanging in here, that means the net forces on it are 0. But that means it's her weight. So these two ropes must add up so that to cancel her own weight. Because if they don't, she's going to fall. If they pull more, she's going to rise. So it has to be exactly what the doctor ordered for it to cancel. But now one of them is actually at a different angle than the other one. The tension in the rope in here is going to be not the same. But their sum will be exactly this one. As a matter of fact, this tension in here should be less than this tension. And that is because of that. So when you add them up, the two tensions, they will give you 
this weight, okay, or, uh, uh, mg. So again, uh, this is the argument I was talking about in here. So the tension on this rope is a lot longer than this tension, so that when I add the two vectors, I found it to be here, okay? And this is Mr. Hewitt himself demonstrating this point, okay? This is the equilibrium condition. Some of the forces must be equal to zero. The reason why you would want some of the forces to be zero is because you cancel all the forces so that the object doesn't go anywhere, stays in its place. So what is the condition of equilibrium? And probably you will have a question like this one in the quiz, is because the sum of the forces, the net force will be zero. This, this symbol sigma, the capital Greek letter sigma stands for net, okay, or the sum. But you don't bother with the with the with the symbols. Okay, just remember that the net force is equal to zero. The net force is equal to zero. Okay, meaning the sum. That's what net means. Of all forces is zero, or they cancel if you like. Okay, that is a condition of equilibrium. If, you, if the sigma bothers you, this is the same thing. What you need to remember is that this F is not a scalar, it's a vector, okay? The force is a vector. That is important in here. I already demoed the, the, the support force. The support force is a force, sometimes called a normal force. That's why you see it in here in parentheses. And this is because it's perpendicular always to the surface. That's why we call it normal force, okay? Because it's always perpendicular to the surface. So the book has a weight in here, mg, and this is the support force, n. What you feel yourself when you stand on a, on a, on a, on a scale is the normal force. You don't feel your own weight. You feel the support force, case in point the following. You go on an elevator and you stand on the scale. And let's say, for example, you weigh 160 pounds or 150 pounds, okay? The scale will tell you you weigh 150 pounds because it's reading the normal force, the support force. Let's say, for example, the, the elevator starts to take up, going up in this scale. Do you feel lighter or do you feel heavier when the elevator is going up? What do you guys think? Heavier. Heavier. And actually, the scale would read more. So if it was reading 150, probably it's going to be 157. If it was 140, probably it's going to tell you 148 or something uh, uh, pounds. Okay, Because you're pressing more on the scale, the scale will press back more on you. Because the, the elevator is accelerating upward. So you feel heavier. Actually, your stomach will go down and you feel like kind of uh, pushed down. You guys understand? So you feel heavier. Let's say, for example, you reach the seventh floor, and now the elevator starts to slow down. Would you feel lighter or heavier? When the elevator is about to reach the end, and now it slows down before it stops. You feel heavier. When the elevator is about to stop, lighter. you're going up? Lighter. Usually people feel like <laughs> they're going to. Yeah, OK? So in that situation, actually, the scale, if you look at it, is going to read less. It's going to read uh, probably instead of 150, maybe 142 or 149, depending on the acceleration, depending on the deceleration there. OK? Here is something that you can do, actually. OK? You can go on an elevator from the seventh floor. I don't know the tallest building in Riverside is that the state of uh, California thing, the business thing. That's at least I have to remember. You can go to that building and stand or sit in the elevator, so go into the elevator and have somebody cut the strings from the elevator. What do you guys feel? Are you going to feel any weight? At least for a short while. When the elevator is in free fall. 
You're going to do that field weightlessness as you hit terminal velocity down the chute. You're going to feel weightless. You lose all the weight. You're going to feel free. I mean, so that's really what you need to do because people are now basically trying to lose weight, lose weight, lose weight. If that's all they are concerned with, all you have to do is take them to that building, collect money before they go into the elevator first, okay? <laughs> and then have them go there, cut the string, and let them uh, lose all the weight they want. Sounds like it's a good plan, isn't it? Does this sounds like it's a good plan for you guys to go in business? Not if you want to attract customers. <laughs> so you can try that, but don't mention my name because they're going to be sued, okay, by the families of those people, okay? <laughs> okay, so again, what you feel is this force, the one that we're talking about, the normal force. The only reason why when the elevator was coming down, when you cut the string and you didn't feel any weight at all because you're not pressing at all on the on the scale. And that's why if you read the scale, it's going to tell you exactly you have zero weight. OK, so this force is an important force. And it's always there. This is a bad example of the normal force because normal force is usually against the surface, whereas this is actually spring force, OK, which is a different kind of force. If you compress a spring, it has spring that's on the other side. If you compress it a little, it's going to exert a force depending on how much compression or how much elongation it has. Okay. Again, this is the example I was talking about. What you read actually is the scales. In this case, if you stand on two scales, each foot will read half the other uh, scale. Okay, that's another trick also you can do to people if you want to lose weight. Give them two scales and tell them, look. What I'm concerned with, make sure that the other scale is not red. And this one is the one red. So they lost half of their weight. Okay, you can do this algebra as much as you want, and they will lose all the weight that they, you want them to lose. OK? We, we try to, 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 I try to get you guys to get you some ideas, maybe to go to business or something like that, hopefully, yeah. OK, let's, let's be serious a little bit in here. OK, hopefully you guys are enjoying yourselves, because I am. I like these things. Anyway, equilibrium is a state of no change with no net force acting. And that is static equilibrium. I mentioned the dynamic equilibrium when you're moving with constant speed. OK, so that is the example for that. And uh, here, you have an object. If you push it, for example, And it's going at constant speed. And if there is a friction in here, you need to maintain at least a force equal to the friction for it to continue moving with that speed. I have a chair right now. I'm going to try to push it. It's not going anywhere because, I mean, although I push, but it's not going anywhere. This object, for example, I'm pushing on it right now, and it's not going anywhere because there is friction preventing it from going anywhere. And that friction is a so-called static friction. But the minute it starts moving, then I have to maintain that in order for me to have it continue moving with constant speed. And that is actually kinetic friction. And the force, in this case of friction, is equal to the force of the, uh, of the, uh, the push, in this case. Okay? Because the sum of these two forces is equal to 0, that means the change in motion is 0. That means the velocity is constant. So this is the dynamic equilibrium that I was talking about. OK, there are more examples in here. So you push a crate at steady speed in a straight line. If the force of friction is 75 newtons, how much force you must apply? How much? If the friction is 75, how much do you need to apply? It has to be? 75. Exactly. Hey. It cannot be less. Cannot be less. Cannot be more either. Has to be exactly 75 because this object is going at steady speed. The key word in here is steady speed. Okay. If you apply more, it's going to gain more speed. It's going to accelerate. If you apply less, it's going to slow down. If you apply just exactly the same amount, it's going to keep that steady speed. Does this make sense to you guys now? 
So if you worded your question differently, then like, let's say, then you'd say if you wanted to push the crate at a faster speed and then your answer would be A, correct? Yes, if you want to gain speed, if you want it to accelerate it, in an accelerated motion, you definitely need to apply more than 75. Okay. So basically how terminal to... velocity works. Uh, terminal velocity is, yes, terminal velocity is when the weight of the object is canceled by the uh, the friction, the, the air resistance in this case, and both of them will be zero. It's exactly the same thing. The terminal velocity will be constant then in that situation. And that's uh, at, uh, at, uh, at uh, uh, where the two forces cancel, namely the weight of the object and the air resistance. That's a good example, okay? But in this situation, the question that was asked that what happened if I wanted to gain more speed, I was going 50 miles per hour, and now I want to go, let's say, for example, 51 miles per hour. Then in this case, the force has to be more than 75. If I want to go less than 50 miles per hour, then I ha she has to push less than 70, 75 newtons, OK? So that this slows down. You guys understand? But now she wants it to stay at steady speed. If that's the case, then the answer is exactly this one. It cannot be more, it cannot be less. This is exactly what the doctor order, ordered. Does this make sense? Yes. yes. Yeah, it does. Yes. Beautiful. Okay. So all of these things are examples. Let me get into this, this point in here, which is a big deal, okay? This is an objection that was done on Mr. Copernicus, actually, before even Mr. Galileo, that, hey, if the Earth is moving like you claim that it is moving, and we just saw it moves super fast, we've been sitting in this class for a little over an hour. We have traveled at more than a hundred thousand kilometers so far. Okay, so if you're saying it travels at a hundred thousand kilometers per hour, then this bird has no chance of catching the worm, because the minute it tries to jump and catch the worm. The worm, the tree, and everything else, and the earth would have moved super fast away. And this bird has to really, really run as fast, faster than a bullet, faster than anything else to catch up with everything, let alone catch the, uh, the worm. Faster than any car that you can imagine, faster than a, the fastest uh, uh, thing, Voyager 1, that basically is traveling with just to catch this worm. And this we don't see. The bird can basically slowly go down, grab the worm, and go up. So they told them, listen, your, the, the, your argument that the Earth is going around the sun is nonsense. Because if it's true, this should not happen. Yet we see it day in, day out, that birds catch their worms all the time. Therefore, your argument is wrong. That's what they told him. Well, the, 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 what they missed then was Galileo's work on the inertia because of the following. When the, the bird left the, the, uh, the branch in there to go toward the, the worm, it was already traveling with the tree and the bird and the, and the worm and the earth with the same speed of 100,000 kilometers per hour. So it's going to continue in that direction with that speed. All it needs to do is gain a little bit of speed in the opposite direction, in the vertical direction to go and get its worm. And that does not need to be super high speed because it has nothing to do with this direction. It's only in this direction that he has to worry about it. So he's still moving with 100,000 kilometers in that direction. So Mr. Galileo was able to support the argument for Copernicus that the Earth is actually going around the sun. You guys understand this idea? Yes. Yeah. This example was given for, for almost 100 years, for almost a century against Copernicus argument about the rotation of the earth until we learn about the, 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 through his work, through the incline and all of that, through the concept of inertia, then it was sounding basically argument based on science and observation that there is actually a reason why there is, we, can, we can say that the worm is still, I mean, the bird is still getting its worm, okay? And uh, case in point, let's say for example, right now, Okay, or about five minutes from now. The earth stops, puts the brakes on, and doesn't continue moving in this, with the same speed. What happened to us? 
We're going to go flying. <laughs> Everything. Actually, the walls are going to be only thing in here that's going to stand behind us, but they're going to fall also. Everything is going to actually, including the mountains, actually, they'll be chipped from everything, okay? So that is because of the inertia. So if this earth decides to stop, the bird, the worm, and actually the tree itself will be yanked from its place, they will all continue flying in the same direction on that circular path. So basically right now the sun is here, we're going around, so for example, right now we cut, we stop, the Earth decides to stop, we're all going to continue in a straight line by this law of Newton, which is really the work of Mr. Galileo. Does this make sense to you guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, this is basically, I mean, there is only this illustration in here, which hopefully you guys can, uh, so there was only a couple of items today for the discussion, so hopefully you guys have picked it up on them. And, uh, uh, any questions? Yeah, I came in late. How long will it take to get this discussion um, on the canvas? The video? Yes. Okay, I have a class at five o'clock. It's going to start in about 45 minutes. And I have a video actually from the morning that I downloaded. That I, download. so I would say probably by hopefully 8 p.m. If not, worst case scenario, it should be ready by 8 o'clock in the morning. I mean, by early in the morning. Here is the deal. I would recommend that you guys go and subscribe to the YouTube channel. So if the video becomes available, there will be at least three videos today. Usually it's about four videos because I have about four classes on, especially on Thursday. Uh, Thursday, how many classes do I have? One, two, three. Yeah, I have actually five classes on Thursday, five different sessions. So just watch for the one that says uh, PHY10. That's gonna be your class. So you can go in there before I go even on Canvas and I have, because I have to wait for basically the YouTube to index it before I go into, into putting the link for it. So sometimes it takes a little bit of time for it to happen. So it's a good idea to subscribe to your channel and just be mindful of the fact that when you go to YouTube, it's going to tell you, this is the title. So you can pick that out or ignore it because it's not your class. I just have a question. Um, I was like following along with like the book as well as your PowerPoints. And I just like um, wanted to kind of know where to focus on like key points for the book and your PowerPoints. Uh, like where should we be like focusing on for this lecture? Okay, the PowerPoint is really a summary of everything in here. I My interpretation of the book sometimes is different than the book itself yeah. because yeah. it's really not, uh, so I would recommend to have the book still to have it as a, uh, as a as a reference because it's going to be useful for doing problems later on. If you see the problems at the end of the book this week, usually I don't assign problems and I don't do stuff with it. But usually from this point on, it's going to be assigned from the book. There should not be much difference at least between the PowerPoint and the book itself because I'm using PowerPoint from the book itself. Let me move this one because it looks kind of weird. I'm sorry, excuse me one second, okay? because I'm talking to the other screen and the other thing doesn't look straight to the camera. So anyway, the, 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 this is a discrepancy between the two. Like I said, it's, I've been teaching this stuff for a long time, so that's why it's coming a little bit different in here, okay? Well, so and your quizzes will be based off the book then? Of the book. Quizzes, the exams and the uh, assignments, all of them off of the book. Okay, okay? great. Okay. Well, what do you have, uh, what, what do you mean by friction? Chow key. Chow key still here? That was the question you asked before. <laughs> sorry, I just have it. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, that's good. <laughs> that's about the, very good. Okay. So if you guys don't have any other questions, I will see you Tuesday next week. And please watch for communications and things like that. And uh, there will be the discussion. I don't know. Hold on. Let me check if it's open or not for this second section for this. So if you guys are ready for the uh, to answer the questions, 
the discussion is actually uh, ready. So you, can, you don't need to wait for the video for those who attended live today, okay? For those who are not live, they can wait for the video, which hopefully will uh, come up later on, okay? Sounds good? Yep, sounds good. Yes. Let me stop the recording first.